Uh, for the record, I'm Alok Mishra. Uh, and uh, I'll be speaking on uh, um, from zero. That probably is not visible, OK. So anyways, uh, so I'll be speaking on uh, from zero dimensions uh, a point to one dimensional string. <clears throat> Very similar uh, to uh, Dr. Clare's talk. Um, I would also like to begin with a brief description of what I refer to as uh, the world line of my thinking self. Um, the same, my academic journey was actually triggered and propelled by my father. The lifeline of my academic trajectory has been my family, two thirds of which, uh, including myself, a set it's, is its own subset in that sense is already here. Uh, my mother and my son are not here because you require somebody to pacify a six-year-old tornado. That's the reason. Uh, there have been four what I call as turning points in my life, in my academic life. And I think this is going to be the only time in my stay here at IIT Roorkee that I would ever be talking about them, so here goes. The first was high school. When I went to my ninth grade, I was fortunate enough to come in contact with a couple of classmates of mine. And believe you me, the interaction with those few classmates awakened the mathematician inside me. The next turning point came when I went to college and I was truly blessed to be taught by Dr. Rajendra Kumar Popli, my undergraduate teacher. It was because of him that I am a theoretical physicist and it was because of him that the theoretical physicist inside me was truly awakened. Then came the five year period of solitude as I call it, during which not only was I away from home for the first time, but I was in fact in a different country as a graduate student working toward my PhD in physics. The first semester I clearly remember was very, very difficult for me emotionally, but I'm very glad that that period actually came to pass. In fact, the very theme of this meeting was something which got incorporated into my thought process for a second time when I was working towards my PhD, the, it had already begun when I was in high school. The transition period from after finishing my PhD and getting a job was very non-trivial. I'll get to that momentarily. And ever since landing a job here, it has been a very non-trivial learning experience, all 11, all 11 years worth of it, and uh, on more than one front. Weirdly enough, during my PhD, I got bored with my PhD thesis topic. Uh, the topic had to do with an interface of what is called as quantum field theory based nuclear physics and elementary particle physics. So nuclear physics, I believe, as the name clearly indicates, has to do with the study of the nuclei. You know, the guy sitting in the center of an atom or a gal. Uh, if you, of course, go deeper in, you would be referring to elementary particle physics. Ironically, the deeper you go, the more elementary it becomes. Changing one's field post one's PhD back then, and I believe even now, is slash was a huge no-no. I was fortunate enough to listen to a seminar as a graduate student on string theory by one of the founders of string theory, John Schwartz. Right off, I knew that that was something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life professionally, post my PhD. So that was a three slide worth of the so-called personal touch, which apparently the toolkit of TEDx uh, warrants for. <laughs> Let me now go to the, get into the meat of the talk, which is elementary particle physics. So more ambitiously put, elementary particle physics is supposed to be the quest for the building block of the building blocks of the universe. Given the 18 minus whatever minutes left, I would begin my short journey from the point, pun intended, where Einstein failed, which was unification of gravity with other forces. The other three forces being electromagnetic, weak, and strong. 
Of course, in the early 20s, it was only gravity and electromagnetism which were in vogue, so to say. Nobody had probably heard of the other two. So, undeterred by the lack of success on the part of Einstein, Sir Einstein, I guess, a pair of gentlemen, Kaluza and Klein, Germans, uh, I guess five years apart, came up with a brilliant idea, according to which, even though four-dimensional Maxwell's electromagnetism and four-dimensional relativity or gravity were very different looking theories in four dimensions, but it was in fact possible, it was shown by them, that both the theories in one dimension higher up would have a common origin. When I talk about dimension, if this auditorium were a cuboid, it would have had a length, a breadth and a height, that's three dimensions, and a tag of time. So therefore, we say that we live in a three plus one dimensional space time. So these guys, what they suggested, that instead of thinking of a three plus one dimensional space time, think of a four plus one dimensional space time. And a five dimensional theory of pure gravity was shown by these two guys to reproduce in four dimensions, one dimension lower, not only electromagnetism, but also gravity. This idea was central to the development many decades later to the notion of unification of all the forces from what are referred to as higher dimensional theories. Let me now begin with the first set of full stops, as they call it, or periods. So I'll be talking about what is referred to as a standard model of particle physics. So the standard model of particle physics, in principle, is supposed to address all, uh, all the interactions except gravity. So in other words, electromagnetism, weak and strong. So when you're talking about interactions between charged particles or currents, you're talking, about, you're talking about electromagnetism. When you're talking about particle decays, for example, beta decays, a neutron getting converted to a proton with emission of an electron referred to as a beta particle and an antineutrino, you're talking about weak forces. And when you're talking about trying to explain how in the world can like charged particles like, like proton continue to form a stable bound state called a nucleus, you're in fact referring to the strong forces. So a bunch of uh, physicists using a toolkit called quantum field theory were able to successfully attack this problem. Now that is not the full stop that I'm referring to. It turns out experiments dictated that the quanta or the messengers of electromagnetic interaction had to be massless. They were called photons. On the other hand, the messengers of quanta weak interactions were concluded to be massive. In other words, having a non-zero mass. So, it was believed, therefore, that electroweak unification was impossible. So that was a, one of the first full stops that theoretical particle physicists had to confront. The trio of Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg thought differently. They questioned the full stop and came up with electroweak theory based on pioneering works of three groups of people, a singlet, Higgs, a triplet of Goralnik, Hagen, and Kibble, and a doublet of Braut and Englert. Higgs and Englert were singled out, partly because they were alive, uh, for the Nobel. And I'm also very proud to say that Charles Richard Hagen, C.R. Hagen, was one of my teachers who taught me quantum mechanics. Uh, in fact, the discovery of the Higgs particle, about which I think even all vernacular regional newspapers always have had some uh, news item to flash, was the last experimentally verifiable piece of the standard model. Let me shift gears and talk about gravity. So, it is possible to in fact study gravity as a separate one plus three dimensional theory, but as a classical theory. It already has a name, it's called general relativity. If you try to quantize this theory using a zero-dimensional particle-like or a point-like approach of quantum field theory, you fail miserably. So that was another huge full stop. To quantize gravity was a huge full stop. Okay. Then, in fact, through indirect routes, into which I will not really get, I will not be talking about that right now. Um, there was a candidate called superstring theory, which was in fact able to unify 
all the four interactions and in the process quantize gravity. But the price required to pay for doing that was all this was done not in one plus three dimensional space time but a one plus nine. Which means you required six extra spatial dimensions. Well, as we've seen, uh, most of the previous presentations, and I'm sure the next even more, were and are going to be very colorful and very visual. I apologize uh, on that, uh, uh, that regard. So this is my excuse for pictures. I'm talking about strings, <laughs> right? So you can, have a, you can have an open string. You can have a closed string. Da. So, but the basic idea behind string theory is very, very deceptively simple. Okay, this is a discovery channel version as I was uh, mentioning uh, to somebody. We all, I mean the usual version of string theory that you see from uh, BBC documentary uh, and so forth is that if you have a string instrument, you pluck it. So classically, we know that it would oscillate in different modes, the fundamental mode and the harmonics. However, if you were to treat a fundamental string and you believe that every mode of oscillation of that fundamental string corresponds to a different particle, that is the basic idea of string theory. Okay? So all matter in the universe is supposed to be some mode of oscillation of a fundamental string. Okay, pictures. So if you look at this left picture, you can think of this as an electron and a proton going in, exchanging a massless photon and going out. This is electromagnetism. You can use the same picture and think of, for example, a neutron and a neutrino going in and coming out as a proton and an electron, this time exchanging a massive vector boson called the W boson, for example. If you rotate this picture by 90 degrees, that's the picture that you get. So these are pictures which a gentleman by the name of Richard Feynman got painted all over his van and got, a, and got a Nobel in exchange. I'm talking about one of the founders of quantum electrodynamics. So these are called Feynman diagrams. As people say, if you fatten up these lines, you come up with what is called as a pants diagram. If you stretch this picture le uh, like so, left and right, you'll generate this picture. If you, if you stretch this pic picture like so, you would be generating the second picture. So this is an example of a closed string scattering Feynman diagram. One of the additional advantages, apart from quantization of gravity and unification of all the forces, is that there are fewer string scattering diagrams as compared to the quantum field theory scattering diagrams to calculate. So it makes the calculation uh, take lesser time. Now, uh, so there were, there were a few questions in one of these uh, breaks, I guess the lunch breaks, uh, about uh, how does one visualize these extra dimensions, okay? So this is another uh, discovery channel kind of an answer, but so what? So if you look at this line segment, obviously you would imagine that this is made up of zero dimensional points, right? But there is a possibility that what you were thinking to be a point is in fact a circle. In other words, if you imagine replacing every point along the line segment by a circle, you would automatically replace a line with a cylinder, a tubular geometry. The converse is in fact even more interesting. If you look at a cylinder, and if you are very far off from the cylinder, what, you, what is a circle would appear to you to be a point. So the idea is that there is a dimension which is along the axis, running along the axis of the cylinder, and then there is a periodic direction, which is a circular direction, an angular direction. If you compactify the angular direction to a very small size, you will not be able to resolve it, or measure it, or perceive it. Now imagine doing this six times over. So imagine that you have six such circles, fibered, using a mathematical lingo, over the non-compact one plus three dimensional space time. So those are the six extra dimensions, which Thus far, the best machines cannot resolve, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist or they might not exist. It turns out that there are beautiful constructs in mathematics which go by the name of manifolds. And so, like the, I guess, most part of the screen, if you're very close up to it, or for example, the surface of the earth, 
you would find it to be flat. So objects which locally or very close up are flat are called manifolds. This is a zero order definition. So that's what I'm going with. The choice, strictly speaking, of these manifolds is dictated by a symmetry called supersymmetry, which is an isomorphism between the two statistically different kinds of particles called bosons and fermions. So the following has to be ensured. You start out with a 10-dimensional theory which has so-called supersymmetry, which says that for every boson there is a fermion and vice versa. Then you use a six-dimensional internal manifold in such a way that when you come down the dimensional ladder from 10 to 4, you have a theory which has no supersymmetry. Because nobody has thus far seen a photino, as I was saying, to somebody. The supersymmetric partner of a photon. Or nobody has ever seen a selectron, the supersymmetric partner of an electron. It turns out that there are a special class of manifolds called the Calabi-Yau manifolds. And the four line description of the basic idea can be summarized as follows. You start out with a 10 dimensional superstring theory. When you compactify it on these special Calabi-Yau manifolds, which are in fact names of two mathematicians, you end up with a four dimensional physics and some six dimensional math slash physics. And the zillion rupees question is, does the physics that pops out in four dimensions match the standard model? Now, if you, are to, if you are claiming your theory to be the toe, the theory of everything, the fundamental theory, you should also be able to do more. It turns out that the standard model of particle physics has of the order of 20 odd constants whose values cannot be determined by the theory. So, your theory should be able to also reproduce the experimentally known values of the fundamental constants in 4D physics. There was a huge embarrassing full stop in string theory, which was there was an embarrassment of riches. There was not a single, but in fact, five equally consistent super string theories. And then comes the gentleman Edward Witten. He, in fact, generated the second string revolution by showing, very similar to the idea of Kaluza and Klein, that even though you have five equally consistent 10 dimensional super string theories, but if you go one dimension higher, you would in fact be landing at the parent theory, which was dubbed as M theory. So this is my last slide. So the Large Hadron Collider at CERN has given us a lot of good stuff, especially the Higgs. But surprisingly, nothing surprising. And the expectation is, maybe by the next upgrade or subsequent upgrades, one could be getting at least a peek into new physics physics beyond the standard model, and if one is lucky, also new mathematics. Thank you.